Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys, welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And with me today is our friend and sister in Christ, Nancy Percy. Nancy, this is your first time on the show, although we have talked before. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dave. And thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's wonderful to talk to you. You're a blessing. Your writing is uh, amazing and incredible. And I'm thankful for the many ways in which the Lord continues to use you. So can you uh, just tell us maybe uh, maybe those... Maybe people aren't familiar with you, although I would find that surprising, but you would find it surprising how few people really know anybody. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Nancy, your life, marriage, ministry, some ministry, any ministry projects that you're working on, those types of things? Well, sure. Yeah, I teach at Christian. I teach at Houston Christian University. Um, I'm a professor and a scholar in residence there. And so that's when you say, what's your ministry project? That's my ongoing ministry project is teaching. Um, but I also have written several books. And you and I uh, tried to talk about my earlier book, Love Thy Body, which yes. is on uh, questions like homosexuality, transgenderism, and so on. And we had technical problems. So I'm glad I'm glad I have a chance to talk to you again. And now today I'm yeah. talking about my new book, The Toxic War on Masculinity. And you asked me a little bit about, you know, who I am and so on. You know, the most important thing about me is my conversion. So I will just start there. Uh, It's like the older I get, the more thankful I am for my conversion. It's like, you know, I'm thankful that God got hold of me. So I was raised in a Lutheran home. It was a very ethnic home. My parents are Scandinavian, and you may know Scandinavians are all Lutheran in somewhat the same way that Italians are all Catholic. And so there was not a whole lot of uh, spiritual reality in our home. Mm. Um, Ethnic religions tend to rely a lot on the ethnicity to hold you. And so when I was in high school, I started asking questions. Mm. Really, one question. I just asked, how do we know Christianity is true? Mm. That was it, really. Um, Because I'm going to a public high school. All my textbooks are secular. All my teachers are secular. And I just start asking, you know, how do we know that Christianity is true? And unfortunately, none of the adults in my life could answer that question. I asked a Christian university professor, point blank, just why are you a Christian? And his answer was, works for me. <laughs> that's, that's it. You know, I wow. was a bit surprised. Yeah. And then I had a chance to talk to a seminary dean, and I thought I would get a more substantial answer from him. But all he said was, don't worry, we all have doubts sometimes. As though really a psychological phase, right? You know, you're going to outgrow it. Wow. And so I did. Eventually, I thought, well, I guess Christianity just doesn't have any answers. And so I didn't just, you know, sort of drift away. I very intentionally walked away from my Christian upbringing and embarked on a search for truth. Because I, well, if this isn't truth, what well, what is? Um, and since I couldn't get any adults in my life to talk to me i that's when i started studying philosophy because mm. i thought isn't that isn't that their job right <laughs> to talk about questions like what is truth and how do we know it and is is there even objective truth and is there a foundation for ethics or is it just true for me true for you and is there meaning to life is there purpose to life and i pretty quickly realized that if there's no God, the answer to all those questions was no, (laughs) there is no objective truth. There's no foundation for ethics. There's no meaning. And so I fairly quickly, by the time I graduated from high school, I had become a completely secular person in my thinking. I was a relativist and a skeptic and, you know, all of these secular isms. And so it was uh, several years later, I was living in Europe. We had lived there when I was a kid. And so I had gone back And that's how I kind of stumbled across the ministry of Francis Schaeffer, who is known for his apologetics ministry in Switzerland. And that was the first time I had ever encountered anyone, (laughs) any Mm. Christian who could answer my questions and who could engage with the secular worldviews that I had absorbed by that time. 
So I was incredibly impressed. And it was through my visit to Libri that I became a Christian. And it's the reason I now teach about apologetics. Um, I teach apologetics and I write about apologetics. And, you know, my, my, my real heart drive is to help young people who have the same questions that I had when I was that age, you know, to help them realize that there really are answers and that Christianity has a wherewithal to stand up, you know, in the marketplace of ideas. And, and so that, that's my goal. That's what I teach my students. Yeah, that's 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 a wonderful testimony, and it's so important because we are living in a day when you know many people don't know the answers. They don't know what they believe. You just look at, you know, I look at the state of theology, Barna's research. You look at that, and you're like, wow. And then I always say, lay that over with the top Christian books, and you're like, holy Moses! No wonder, you know, uh, we got problems, Batman. You know, um, so. You know, we we need more voices to stand up uh, like like you have for so many years. And so I'm 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 thankful that that you are still going and still speaking. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, can you uh, tell us about this new book, uh, The Toxic War on Masculinity, How Christianity Reconciles the Sexes, why you wrote it and, you know, how you hope it'll be received? So the title of the book sort of, um, by the way, is a play on words because I didn't want to even use the phrase toxic masculinity because I don't think it is toxic. And so the way I got around that, you still had to use those words, right? Because that's that's the common phrase. So I said the toxic war on masculinity so that people would sort of do a double take like, wait, what? (laughs) The toxic war? So that's my way of signaling. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the topic, but. I don't accept the idea that masculinity is inher- is inherently toxic. It is, you know, obviously God made men. <laughs> Let's get back to Genesis. Obviously. Amen. 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 <laughs> what God makes is intrinsically inherently good. So we need to start there. So where did this idea of toxic masculinity come from? Well, it has it has deep roots. Um let, let me start by saying there's an interesting sociological study that found that actually there's two scripts for masculinity out there. It was, so this was not a, not a Christian sociologist. He's, he's a non-Christian, but he came up with this really interesting uh, experiment. And by the way, I put it right at the beginning of the book. And the reason I do this, (laughs) you, I can tell you some of the background that's not actually in the book, but this is, this has turned out to be the most controversial book I've written. And Mm. that surprised me. Because I would have thought Love Thy Body, my earlier book, would be, since it deals with topics like abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism. But in fact, this one has proved to be more controversial, at least in the Christian world. And uh, I, I taught a couple of classes on the manuscript, and I led some reading groups on the manuscript. And when they would tell their family and friends uh, you know, that, that they were doing a book on masculinity, invariably, the first question was, Whose side is she on? You know, with that tone, you know, whose side is she on? As as if you have to be on one side or the other. You know, you you, ha- you have to either either be a male bashing feminist, or you have to be some kind of angry reactionary. And so I put this at the beginning of the book because it tends to diffuse that by saying, actually, there's two competing scripts for masculinity, and you don't have to be whole self, you know, for or against. <laughs> by the way, the second question was always. And why is a woman writing a book on masculinity anyway? <laughs> so, so that's what I got. I had to rewrite chapter one many times. And this was the most helpful thing. I put this at the beginning. There's a sociological study. So this sociologist is so well known that he gets invited to speak all around the world. And so he came up with this little experiment where he asks young men two questions. The first question is, what does it mean to be a good man? And he said, men have no problem answering that question all around the world, whether, you know, Australia, Germany, Brazil, whatever. He said they easily answer things like honor, duty, sacrifice, do the right thing, be a provider, be a protector, be responsible, be generous. I mean, it's all it's all the same everywhere around the world. And I thought that was fascinating. You know, men are made in God's image and they do know what it means to be the good man. A sociologist would ask them, well, where'd you learn that? And they would say, well, it's it's just in the air we breathe. Or if Mm. in a Western culture, they would say, 
it's part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. And then he would follow up with a second question, though. And he would say, what does it mean if I say to you, man up, be a real man? Good news. Good news. You know, people often accuse evangelical Christian men of, you know, being oppressive, patriarchs prone to abuse. But you're making the claim in this book that they test out with the lowest level of abuse and divorce. You know, e- explain that. Explain what you mean. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, if there's a sort of an exhibit A of toxic masculinity, it usually is Christian evangelical men. And by the way, it was very easy to go online and find examples, you know, to introduce this chapter of the book. Uh, I'll read you just two of them. So this was this was from a Christian publication. Mm. Um, and here's a quote. It is no secret that abuse is prevalent in conservative churches that embrace headship theory. And this is a quote from the co-founder of the Church 2 movement. She said the theology of male headship feeds the rape culture mm. that we see permeating American Christianity today. The problem with these accusations is that they ignore the data from the social sciences. You know, uh, psychologists and sociologists were reading these accusations and saying, well, where's your evidence? You know, where's your evidence for these charges? And so they went out and did the studies. And what I found, I, I quote about a, a dozen different studies, and they uniformly find that Christian men who are really authentic, you know, committed, attend church regularly, actually test out as the most loving husbands and fathers of any group in America. So starting with being loving husbands, by the way, they do interview the wives separately, which oh, is good. important. <laughs> yeah. And they um, concur. And, <laughs> and so what they're really saying is that the wives report mm. being the happiest with their husband's expressions of love and affection. Evangelical fathers test out as being the most loving fathers, in, both in terms of shared activity, like sports and church youth group, and in terms of discipline, like um, setting limits on screen time or enforcing bedtime. And as you noted, evangelical couples actually have the lowest level of divorce And the real surprise, they have the lowest level of domestic violence of any group in America. And so uh, that's what I said (laughs) when I read this. I said, wow, we need to get this information out there. It it, it hasn't entered the public consciousness yet. It's not in the popular press yet. I had to go digging in academic sociological journals (laughs) to find this material. And so it it really is the main reason I wrote the book is I thought we need to get this out to encourage Christian men you know, to get churches to realize yeah. that they need to be more encouraging, that Christian men are, do- are actually doing a good job. Let, let me summarize with a quote. So this is a quote from one of my favorite, my favorite sociologists. Um, he's considered like the top marriage sociologist in the country. And so he he gets published in places like the New York Times and the Washington Post. His name is Brad Wilcox at the University of Virginia. And so this was a quote in an article he published in the New York Times. And he says, it turns out that the happiest of all wives in America are religious conservatives. And by the way, they focus on the wives because the assumption is that if you believe in any form of male authority, you know, that turns you into an overbearing, tyrannical patriarch. So they do focus on, well, are the wives happy? The happiest of all wives in America are religious conservatives. Fully 73% of wives who hold conservative gender values and attend religious services regularly with their husbands have high quality marriages. So this is not, this is positive scientific research. In other words, it's not just a, you know, a sermon by a pastor saying, yay, raw, you know, trying to rev you up. This is, this is scientific data from the academic literature. These are sociological and psychological studies. And so we really should be confident in bringing it out, not only into our churches, but into the public arena to show that the media messages have it all wrong. The the messaging that we get from the secular media is totally mistaken. And You know, and we've got the data to prove it. Yeah. Well, one other thing, I think, not just academic wise, but like in practice, there are people engaging in counseling around our country. And they're telling men that if you believe that you're the leader of the home, 
that you're somehow that view will lead you to commit domestic abuse or you you are the reason why you know there is domestic abuse if there is in the home and and other things it's like well you know there's probably a lot more i mean i'm not saying we're obviously against any form of abuse of any kind we would never approve that or anything of the like but to blame the man as the only cause of it that is that that's to me is like taking it down from the top shelf like you're talking about from the academic side and down into the counseling office and i've heard this so many times I can't even tell you where men are being told by counselors that you know they're the problem and well what about the wife i mean it takes two to they say it takes two to tango i've counseled many married couples over the years and i can tell you it takes two what what what's happening here you know, and and to focus on one to the exclusion of the other, you know, and, and again, I just want to say this because I know that's a really sensitive subject. You know, we are as Christians 100 percent against uh, abuse of any kind or dereliction um, on, on either uh, either the man or the woman or anything of the like or or with children and, and on and on. But we, we have to be able to. They have to be able to say something, you know, and, uh, you know, I know it is controversial to to say what you're saying and what I'm saying, but I think it still has to be said out loud. Um, un unfortunately, it needs to be said and it needs to be said clearly and it needs to be said persuasively. Well, uh, in, in my book, The Toxic Boy Masculinity, I do show where that misconception comes from. And because most people, uh, the first pushback that I get is but wait a minute haven't we all heard that christians divorce at the same rate as the rest of the culture yep and so in fact in my research i found out that that's one of the most widely quoted statistics by christian leaders and so the researchers went back to the data and what they did is they divided out the the evangelical christian men who are truly committed and and who do a church right attend church regularly from merely nominal Christians. Um, my students don't even know what the word nominal means, so I have to explain. <laughs> uh, nominal means in name only. N-O-M is Latin for name. And so these are men who, in a survey like this, might check the Baptist box, for example, but who attend church rarely, if at all. Mm. And they test out shockingly differently from committed christian men they do they do fulfill all the negative stereotypes they are they they have the least happy marriages their wives report being the least happy in terms of their relationship with their husbands they have the least they are the least engaged with their children mm. they have the highest rate of divorce higher than secular men wow and they have the highest rate of domestic violence higher That's than secular men so this is why people get their false conceptions of, of evangelicalism, because, well, first of all, if you just look at evangelicals as a whole, you're putting men who are better than secular men in the same numbers with some men who are worse than secular men. Obviously, the numbers are going to be misleading. Uh, and I've, one of the things that surprised me is we're talking about about, this, about the same numbers. You know, you and I probably hang out mostly with fairly committed Christian men. And so my first impression was that nominals were a small group, <laughs> but they're not. Um, you know, we have an awful lot of cultural Christianity in America. And so the nominals are about the same size in terms of sheer numbers. So if you run into somebody who claims an evangelical identity, you know, you have about a 50-50 chance that they're actually committed or they're just nominal. So this is an important thing for churches to know, I think, um, in particular, because we can be much more positive to the men who are doing a good job. You know, it's time to stop, you know, berating them and telling them to do better. One of my students is a leader at a very large um, Baptist church, uh, women's leader. And she said, on, on Mother's Day, we hand out roses and tell women how wonderful they are. On Father's Day, we scold the men and tell them to do better. <laughs> so we need to stop that. These men are doing better. They're doing much better than... The and yelling at them and talking <laughs> down to them and making them feel like they're, you know, worse than the pile of garbage in the in the dump, you know? Exactly. 
Exactly. You know, I really want the churches to get the positive message first so that we can build up Christian men because they're getting the same negative messages that all the other men are, you know, that something's wrong with them just for being men. Uh, But then we also need to think about how to reach out to these nominal men because they're the ones who are, in in a sense, ruining our reputations, so to speak. And giving people the impression that there's so many evangelical men, you know, who are patriarchal and abusive and so on. Yes, the nominal men are that way. How can we be better at reaching out to them and helping them to really understand the biblical meaning? See, what's what's happening, of course, is that they hang out on the fringes of the Christian world enough to pick pick up the language of headship and submission. But then they infuse secular definitions you know from the secular script for masculinity definitions of entitlement and dominance and so on and so they're getting in a sense the worst of both worlds you know they're they've got the christian language but they've got the secular definition and by the way that's another reason i wrote the book because we have to know then what the secular definition is and where did it come from even if we're just going to deal with our christian men at least the nominals we have to understand what the secular world is is thinking because that you know permeates the christian world as well yeah absolutely well i mean you have men uh, i remember preaching at a men's retreat and this guy i was talking about repentance and i said you need to be specific in your repentance with your spouse and your spouse wants you to do that and he said there's no way you're you're not there's no way that you're telling me that that's true and i said i said um in front of everybody i said to him looked him in the eyes and i said you call your wife after this is done and you call and ask her and then you come back to me and you tell me he never came back to me. In fact, I've told many men that they've not a single one has ever come back to me and said anything. You know, isn't that interesting? Not a single one. I've told I mean, now by now I've told tens of tens of many, many men that and they've not single one has ever come back to me and said my wife doesn't want that because that's what your wife that's what a wife wants yeah yeah they don't understand it is what a wife wants but it also is it shows how much courage it takes to live out a biblical masculinity you know because people tend to think you know well biblical masculinity means servant leadership that means be a wimp you know i mean be weak and if i you know if i confess my sins that means i'm you know i i'm and it's an invitation to be walked over. <laughs> and many people don't realize, no, actually, it, it takes a lot more courage to really confess your sins to one another. As James puts it, you know, confess your sins to one another and be healed. It actually takes a, a lot more courage. You know, the secular script defines courage in terms of dominating others, you know, and winning. Whereas scripture defines courage more in terms of facing your own sins and weaknesses and faults and being courageous enough to really face them and deal with them. So I think it's part of redefining a very definition of things like courage and strength so that we have a more biblical understanding of masculinity. Yeah. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, like the boomer generation, which would have been maybe a little bit before my dad, you know, or right around there, you know, World War II, that, that kind of not World War II, but like Korea and Vietnam type generation, they're kind of taught, my understanding is just basically don't deal with your emotions. And that was that was my dad, just kind of stuff my both of my parents just stuff your emotions down and you know, don't deal with them. And we obviously see that's why we have the book of Psalms and you know, all these things. And they were, you know, my both my parents are Christians, so they've said, This is what I was taught. And I'm like, that's really interesting. And Let's talk about now what the Bible says. And they're like, I can't believe this, that we were taught these things from all these things on marriage and parenting and all these things. And they were, you know, maybe good things at the time, but they were like the latest fad. And, you know, they missed the Bible, you know, which is most a lot of fads do. So, I mean, to be honest... If you look at scripture, a lot of the great men in scripture were very emotional. You know, they did not think expressing emotions was effeminate or weak. You know, look at Joseph, who wept when he was being reconnected with his brothers. Uh, and you mentioned the Psalms. Look at David, who says, you know, my my tears are soaking my bed tonight, you know, because I'm weeping so much. And look at, uh, well, look at Jesus. Hebrews says that he offered up his prayers with with tears. 
So mm. apparently, Jesus wept many more times than just, just that one verse. You know, apparently he wept frequently. And Paul, Paul in, in several places talks about how he, he ministered to people with tears, with tears. So I think that we need to recover the notion that having a strong emotional life is part of your strength. It's not part of, um, it's not a matter of weakness. I even did a, a study of the word meek because, you know, in the King James Version, it says that Jesus, Jesus says, learn from me from I am gentle and meek at heart. And of course, we have invested that word with meek, meek. Oh, man, that means, you know, bland, colorless, you know, walk all over me. <laughs> so in the, New in the New Testament era, though, it, when historians went back and looked at how that word was used by the surrounding culture, it was used in a variety of ways. It was used for a, a war horse, a war horse you know, mm. that was uh, strong and courageous, but under control of its master. So it, was, it implied strength under control. Yeah. And I think it was Plato who used the word to mean uh, a, a conquering general who is merciful to those that he's conquered. He called that meek. So if we look at the way the word was used, the Greek word in the New Testament times, it did not mean wimpy. <laughs> it yeah. meant strength under control. And so we have to go back and realize that even our, the language that we associate with Jesus often implied something quite different from the sort of Victorian Jesus meek and mild you know, Sunday school image that we have had. Yeah, that's really good. You know, well, the long term strategy for preventing toxic behavior in men is, you know, for fathers to deeply invest in their sons. But the media portrays our media portrays fathers as foolish. Where did that negative image come from? Yes, I really think that the long term solution to any sort of toxic behavior in men is the father son relationship. We know that fatherless homes are subject to far more social pathologies, that fatherless kids are more likely to have trouble in school, more likely to have addictions, more likely to have kids outside of marriage, more likely to end up behind bars. I used to work for Prison Fellowship, which is an international prison ministry, and we knew 90% of the people behind bars are male, and most of those are from fatherless homes. So it is really serious that in our sort of a media culture today, fatherhood is mocked and ridiculed and fathers are made fun of. They're made the butt of the joke. And so I did want to say, you know, where do we, where did this come from? And it goes back much further than people realize. It goes back to the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, men worked alongside their, their wives and their children all day, right? And the family farm, the family industry, the family business, and so fathers were intimately involved with their sons, teaching them adult trades, working with them side by side. It was expected that fathers would be as, as involved with their kids as mothers were. In fact, most childbearing literature back then was addressed to fathers, sermons and childbearing books and so on. They were addressed to fathers. Whereas today, if you go into a typical bookstore, you know, the vast majority are written to, to mothers. So how did we lose that sort of close connection between fathers and sons? The Industrial Revolution took work out of the home. And of course, men had to follow their work out of the home into factories and offices. And that bond between father and son was broken. And already in the 19th century, you see a lot of the literature of the time lamenting the fact that kids, that sons in particularly wild and unruly and rambunctious and rule breaking and misbehaving, that was not a concept before that. If anything, boys were thought to be more obedient than girls because, and here's why, all the way back to the ancient Greeks and Romans, people thought that men were morally superior to women. Right. They thought that the insight into right and wrong is a rational insight, and men were thought to be more rational, and therefore men were more virtuous. In fact, the word virtue, the Latin root is, is the first three letters, V-I-R. And it means man, like the word virile, you know, virtue came from met manly. It, it had connotations of manly strength and honor. And so boys were thought to be, if anything, for an American infant, isn't that a great word? Mm -hmm. Half orphan since their, husband, their fathers were no longer in the home. And he said, Our children left up to female guidance in the home, the school and the church. 
And so because men were no longer intimately involved with their families all week, day in and day out, already in the 19th century, you see start people starting to say fathers have become irrelevant. You know, they don't know what's happening in the home. They're not familiar with the family dynamics. They no longer know their children the way they used to. They're not, you know, they don't know their kids' emotions, their kids' experiences. And they started being portrayed as irrelevant and incompetent. And I thought, wow, that's much earlier than any of us guessed. Soon after the- I was thinking about it. my dad, we did a relationship until I was 16. And then um, there was a lot of abuse, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. So this will be maybe a good segue into that. But uh, the Lord, the Lord intervened and uh, we were, you know, I was a Christian and I was sitting reading my Bible and um, Colossians 3.13, uh, we're told, commanded to forgive. It's an imperative to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. And so uh, I was immediately convicted sitting in my room as a junior in high school. Mm. And uh, mm. the next day, my dad and I were going to go play golf because I was on the varsity golf team. And and so uh, instead of doing that, w- we ended up taking a walk. Well, the Lord was at work in my dad's life, too. And so as I took a, we took a walk, I said, I have something to tell you, dad. And uh, I said, you know, I've held on to this bitterness and resentment for a lot of different reasons, uh, things with my mom, my older brother, on and on, things that have happened. And, uh, but I want you to know that the Lord dealt with that and he convicted me and I repented and confessed my sin to the Lord. And I know that I'm forgiven. And he was just, he started crying Mm -hmm. and, uh, he said, you know what? The Lord's been at work in my life too. And, and I'm telling you, you know, sometimes reconciliation can happen in a moment and sometimes it can take a long time for my dad and I, it was in a moment. It was like, Mm -hmm. snap your finger and just things changed. It just, it was, it was all, it was not us. It was all the Lord. It was all, you know, his grace. And I know that for a lot of men that that never happens, you know, but, you know, you know, there, there's it's a, it, I also had a lot of men that had helped me to get to that place where I could have, mm-hmm. you know, forgive my dad. And so, you know, it's it's a real it's a real thing, you know, that's that's out there. There's so many young men, I mean, that I've talked to over the years and 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 on and on. I mean. You know, we could be here a long time talking about this, but, you know, that's why repenting of your sin, confessing it, not excusing it, it it goes a long way. It goes much further than, I mean, obviously it affects our relation with the Lord, but it but it also affects our relationship with others far more than I think that we we would ever really even know or understand. I don't I don't pretend to have all the answers on that and how far, but I just know that it 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 works and you know god tells us in his word that it does you know if you're if you're just out there listening and wondering what do i do you know that's be be encouraged by that story that i shared and there's a hundred others behind it yeah what do you uh you know as as you you know have worked on you know this you know topic um you know at the end of the book you really address the problem of abuse in christian homes how can you know churches respond to this and you know, help men uh, to help their sons and and those types of things, so that so that we can see the home, you know, strengthened. Well, I want to start out by identifying with your story. Um, I st- I start the book with my own story of of a very abusive father, and he was severely physically abusive. And in in, uh, in books on abuse, they often ask, was it open hand or closed fist? And it was close fist. You know, he was punching us and kicking us and it was quite severe. And so in in some ways, as I put it in the introduction, I say in some ways I've been writing this book my whole life because I had to figure out, you know, what is a healthy masculinity? And uh, I was interviewed, by the way, uh, by a Christian psychologist about a week ago. And he said, he said, when I first started reading the book, I thought, oh, no, (laughs) it's going to be an angry woman. You know, she's she's been abused and now she hates men. And then he said, actually, as I got into the book, I found out it's not that way at all. You know, it's very clear that you have gone through a lot of emotional, psychological, spiritual healing. And it comes, it ends up being very, very male friendly, male supportive. Uh, and I'm glad that he he felt that it does come across as very positive toward men as a result. But 
the way I got there um, was was actually that was part of my visit to Labrie. I mentioned earlier that I be, I became a Christian through visiting Labrie, which is Francis Schaeffer's ministry in Switzerland. And of course, what first got me uh, was the apologetics, because I did have a lot of intellectual questions by then, and I needed those to be answered. Francis Schaeffer was known for uh, saying, we need to give honest answers to honest questions. And it was the first place that I met Christians who actually treated my questions as though they were honest, you know, and not just, you know, what's wrong with you? You don't have faith. But at Labrie was also on staff, a psychiatric social worker. And she was there because she realized that for many people, their uh, their barriers against Christianity are not just intellectual, but also emotional, um, especially uh, your relationship with your parents. Uh, and especially pastors, kids and missionary kids. She herself was a missionary kid. She was the first person to help me to start the process of healing from my the trauma of my childhood. I had tried to wipe it all out. When I left home, I said, my childhood was so painful. I'm leaving it behind. I'm going to, you know, start with a blank slate. I'm going to recreate myself from scratch. <laughs> And she helped me to realize, actually, you can't do that. You know, you carry this with you no matter what, and you do need to get healing. And through her, I really experienced God's love. I mean, the ultimate, ultimately, I was experiencing God's love through her. I had never experienced the quality of love that I could talk about my, you know, my inner pain and my experiences. And she just kept loving me. And in fact, when I left Labrie, in many ways, my image of God was based on her. Her name was Sheila Bird. And we called her Birdie. So <laughs> my image of God was based on Birdie for a long time because that was the only person who would love me so so thoroughly. And so I was able to experience God's love as a result. And in the end, you know, I, I think that's that's what ultimately gives emotional healing is just having a relationship with God that's so intense and so deep that it, you have an experiential sense of God's love. Love heals. Bottom line, love heals. And so feeling loved by God is the ultimate form of emotional healing. Amen. So how can how can uh, the church, you know, respond more uh, effectively, you know, to abuse in the in the home? Yeah. So I was a little surprised by what you said. So um, because you said that in your experience, a lot of times it's the man who's been blamed. And in my experience, it's been the opposite. Um, it's been that the woman is held responsible for the relationship. Um, you know, the, that in counseling sessions, she is often told, you know, if you would just forgive more, if you would just love more unconditionally, if you would just have sex more often, if you would make his favorite foods, if you would lose uh, 30 pounds, if you would look better, <laughs> then uh, he would blossom into the man you want him to be. That's a direct quote from a woman who was being abused. That's what her pastor told her. And wow. so m my experience has been that whoever it is who's who's being abused is often told it's your job to fix the other person. And fortunately, the literature on abuse, you know, this is a good time to write the book because the literature on abuse from a Christian perspective is changing. And it's starting to say it's not the victim's fault. It's the, the solution is Matthew 18. Matthew 18, you know, is the verse on what to do if somebody's sinning against you. Matthew 18 says, you know, it, you're supposed to confront them. Loving confrontation. You're supposed to hold them accountable for their sin. And oddly enough, you know, this passage has not been applied so much to marriage. But we all know that... And uh, on the playground, for example, it, if there's a playground bully, you don't acquiesce to the bully. He gets worse. You know, we know it from international affairs. If there's a belligerent nation, you don't try to appease them. We learned that in World War II. <laughs> you don't try to appease. They just get worse. And so ironically, people haven't thought, well, wait a minute, maybe in marriage, if you just try to be kinder and nicer and forgive more, actually, it doesn't work. If you have somebody who's truly sinning in the relationship, they take kindness as weakness. You know, they, they take forgiveness as permission to keep doing it. I guess, you know, I guess this person's OK with it because they just keep forgiving me. So a lot of the books on uh, on domestic abuse now are being written from the perspective of how do we hold 
someone accountable if they are genuinely sinning in the relationship? You know, how can the pastor, you know, counsel a couple on how to hold one account, one another accountable instead of just sort of acquiescing, forgiving more and so on, which was kind of the party line for a, a long time. It's now how can we help hold the victim, you know, whether it is the man or the woman, how can we hold the person who's primarily on the receiving end? How can yeah. we hold the person uh, accountable? If there's real sin in a relationship, you address the sin. Um, so that's the bottom line. Yeah. You, know, that you, you treat Husband and wife are, first of all, brother and sister in Christ. And they should treat each other as brother and sister in Christ. The relationship of husband and wife, which is more specialized, should be on top of their, uh, their prior relationship as brother and sister in Christ. It should not compete with it. It should not den- uh, uh, counter it. It should not contradict it. And so I think that's maybe the mentality t- t- to bring to marriage. Yeah. And and I just want to say it's tragic that any pastor would say what you just said to anybody. And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen or anything like that. Um, I'm just saying I spent I've, I've spent a lot of time in men's ministry in the local church. So I've, I've seen the apathy in Christian men and mm-hmm. and all across the board. And it would blow your mind. Um, it would blow up people that listen to this mind um the level of apathy towards pretty much everything but you know that doesn't mean on the other hand that i'm gonna say oh well you know that there's not issues on the other side as well because i mean there are so you know i'm just saying you know as from my vantage point doing men's ministry as i have you know that's that's what i've seen from men is what i mean and uh but I know that there's issues like with in women's ministry as well. And uh, I'm concerned about both. I mean, we have to care about both. So I think that. Let, let me give you some of the research that yeah. um, I thought was helpful. And this is not from a Christian. This is a, the, the top marriage psychologist in the nation, probably, is uh, John Gottman. John Gottman is a uh, Jewish background, and he was a mathematician. And he brought that with him into being a psychologist. And so he has the most quantifiable data out there. Um, he he takes a married couple. They actually live in this like bed and breakfast for a couple of days and they get wired up so they can test their, uh, their heart rate and their breathing rate and their stress hormones. And they they uh, have complex coding for uh, all the, the language that they use, you know, from put downs to placating and Anyway, and it's all fed into a computer and analyzed. And he became famous because he can predict with 93.6 accuracy whether a couple will divorce wow. after watching them for only 15 to 20 minutes. Really? Wow. It's, you can see why that made him famous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's how, pretty amazing. How, how accurate is he, though? 93.6. <laughs> 93. Wow. I mean, that's that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. And, but here's what he found. Um, he found the the health of a relationship. This was the most surprising thing. The health of a relationship depends mostly on the man. And he doesn't say that to blame or shame them, but he tells them that to give them a sense of how much power they actually do have to improve their marriage. And here's how he puts it. It is mostly women who read books on relationship, you know, who go to therapy, who seek pastoral counseling. And so he says, actually, what matters is whether the man responds. And he says, unfortunately, too often they don't. And and he said, 65%, again, everything's quantified, 65% of men, he said, do not accept influence. That's his phrase. Do not accept influence from their wives, meaning they don't really pay attention to the wives' concerns. They don't listen to their wives' voice. They don't involve their wives in decision making. And he said, when they don't do that, their marriage is 81% more likely to break up, you know, to either either divorce or just to fall into a long time unhappiness. And so he, he, has a, he has a book in which he directly addresses men. And he says, I just want you to realize how much power you actually have in your relationship. Mm. Because, and, and here's how he puts it, as a man, You have, by a wide margin, that's his word, by a wide margin, you have the most power to improve your relationship and make it work. And so, again, he's not trying to blame and shame men. 
Right. But he is trying to show them that they have more power than they realize that. And I love that because he states it so positively, you know, that you have the power to change your relationship and the statistics show it overwhelmingly. Uh, so th- that's good data, again, to bring into counseling with men and yeah. counseling in marriages and, 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 and men's retreats and so on, because it's an empowering message that they can, in fact, make a difference. Amen. Yeah, it's really good. Well, Nancy, where can people go uh, find out more about you on a line or on social media? Yeah, so I do have a new website that's fun and colorful. So nice. please go there. <laughs> yeah, my publisher helped me redo it. So um, nancypiercy.com, nancypiercy.com. And so you can order books there. You can look up, check out my earlier books and uh, if you want to. And of course, you can always buy your books on Amazon or christianbook.com or wherever your favorite books are but yes or or you go to my website and check out the check out uh, other books as well but just as we wrap up and that that's a good reminder you know do go to amazon um and pick up the book or wherever you get christian books but just as we wrap up uh this conversation uh do you have any takeaways for those who listen or watch any takeaways well you know when people say the bottom line why did you write this book Bottom line is the sociological data showing that Christian men do so well. Mm -hmm. I said this, that was when I decided I have to write this book because we are not aware of that. We all are getting the negative messages from our culture and those messages are wrong. And I, like I said, we're even getting them in the Christian world. And so I, I needed to get this message out of the academic literature you know, and into the hands of people who can really encourage Christian men. Mm, Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Nancy. Uh, Guys, gals, uh, Nancy's book is The Toxic War on Masculinity, How Christianity Reconciles the Sexes. I recommend that you pick this up and, hey, get it to your pastor, get it to those in uh, church leader, your church leadership, and uh, especially working with men. I think that you'll find this to be a very helpful resource. And as always, uh, you'll find lots of stories. And as Nancy is like a walking encyclopedia with her, uh, all these stats and information uh, that you'll find that and more in the book, along with a lot of uh, scripture as well. So thank you so much, Nancy, for your time. Oh, thank you. And thanks for your excellent questions. I'm, I enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Me too. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.